Aloha Friday, everyone. You photo lovers out there, you're watching I Love Photography Live. This is Alan Murabayashi coming to you from New York City, the home of Photo Shelter World Headquarters. We have another packed show uh, for you today. Hopefully you are not watching us on youtube.com slash photo shelter to see our faces because Sarah and I were a little tired today. Got some bags under the, eye, the eyes. Um, but we're going to, uh, you don't want to see our faces anyway, so maybe you should check it out. Uh, to see all of the uh, images that we're looking at, or you might be listening to the podcast by going to iTunes and searching for I Love Photography. As always, all the links to all the stories you hear today will be on blog.photoshelter.com. And with that, let's say hi to Sarah Jacobs. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Alan. How you doing? I'm tired. Yeah, I'm tired. yeah. Why don't Good we just talk week. about photos? Yeah, long, long week. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about photos. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Now, Sarah, I know that you are not the biggest uh, sports fan. No. But let me tell you something. Okay. There's a dude, there's a guy in New York, and his name is Derek Jeter, and he's been playing baseball in New York for the same team for 20 years. That doesn't happen anymore. That guy's got to be tired. 20 years on the same team. Hmm. He's sort of infamously um, low-key uh, with the press, and so I've never actually seen like a big spread, a photo spread and a big article on Derek Jeter. But, you know, he, he played his last game at Yankee Stadium last night. Uh, he won the game with a, with a hit that brought the runner in. It was tied 5-5. He hit it, you know, Yankee folklore fashion. <laughs> the guy scores. They win. Everybody's happy. Um, and then last week, this came out in New York Magazine, uh, Christopher Anderson, as you know, he's a big contract photojournalist, uh, worked for Time, etc., um, and is now the staff photographer at New York Magazine, and he photographed Dark Jeter. And this was the opening photo for it. And there are many photos in here, many of which were f uh, uh, from a commercial that he was filming where Chris was kind of on set. It's a lovely photo of Dark Jeter. He looks happy. It looks very happy. <laughs> I mean, the guy makes, you know, a billion dollars a year or whatever he's making nowadays through endorsements and uh, his contract. But, you know, scrolling down. First of all, I love that opening photo. And then I'm scrolling down, and you see something like this. So it's his, his masseuse, his longtime masseuse, just beating him down. <laughs> he's got a funny expression on his face. And there's, like, the Travago guy in the background. or some, Something's going on on the TV in the background. Um, and just, like, another really pleasant inside moment from the life of Derek Jeter in what looks to be a pretty sparsely decorated apartment. <laughs> yeah. Right. Are they in like an empty is he in the process of moving out? What's going on? Yeah, exactly. It's not you know, he's got a he's got a ginormous mansion in Florida, so I guess he's keeping it keeping it uh, you know, low key here in New York. Who knows? Um, and here's some other ones, you know, uh, out of the car, like a lovely framed out of the, the car window shot. Uh, at home with his parents in Tampa, doing some yoga. Um, and it's funny because normally you'll see Jeter either in sports action photos or you'll see him in an ad for Gatorade or Nike or whatnot. And to see this style of photography with such an icon, I, I just think it's great. I really like this photography. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I've never... I mean, I, like you said, I'm not a huge sports fan, but I did catch the last, like, five minutes of this game while I was waiting for takeout at a bar did you last really? night. <laughs> yeah. And then everyone in the bar was freaking out, and I'm like, oh, hey, like, there's that guy. This guy? <laughs> no, I knew of him, of course, <laughs> but I was like, oh, well, glad I caught the last five minutes of that. <laughs> So. I really like this essay. You know, there's some sometimes when Chris Anderson shoots for New York Magazine, he gets a little weird. Yeah, his work can be very strange. His fashion work for New York Mag is definitely weird. Yeah, and he's had something like he had he had a set of photos uh, two years ago where they that they were all kind of underexposed or they were just really flatly toned. Uh -huh. You know, he experiments a lot visually, which I think it's cool, but he doesn't always hit it. Mm -hmm. For these, which is you know, it's like his forte, it's just straightforward photojournalism. Right. Um, editorial style. Just really, really nailed it. So here's a, a little congratulations to Derek Jeter. Uh, I think he has uh, five rings with the Yankees um, and uh, 20 years. 
nobody stays on the same team anymore. That's that's the other part of it, just because of the whole free agency thing. But so Derek Jeter, true New York Yankee and Major League Baseball hero, and nice work, Christopher Anderson. Yeah, nice work, Christopher. We were talking about hipstamatic. When was that? When we were hanging out at Photoville, we were talking about hipstamatic because yeah. we said, "What happened to hipstamatic?" <laughs> the founder of hipstamatic uh, spoke at Luminance. Yeah, in 2012. In 2012, and at that point, literally like two months before Instagram had just blown up. And prior to Instagram, Hipstamatic was like the thing. Hipstamatic was the photo app out of the thousands of photo apps. And Instagram came out and Hipstamatic just kind of disappeared and, you know, it, it had been known for sort of their filmy emulation um, and they did some partnerships with people. I think they actually did one, Taro Kuyama, who's actually at Facebook now. Hi. Um and but then Visco Cam came by and now everybody's using Visco for all those emulation things. Right. So yeah. It's kind of like Instagram and Visco Cam and Hipstamatic. We didn't even know whether it still existed, and then on the time late box we came across this. Um, yeah, literally okay. the next day. We were yeah. like, what, what happened to Hipstamatic? And then this comes out like the following day. We're like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so Hipstamatic uh, is throwing together a little foundation. Uh, to empower young people in the inner cities to use photography. And I couldn't think of like a better outcome. You know, if you're not going to, if, if, if one day you're king of the hill in the photo world and then the next day Instagram takes you out and then you have sort of an identity crisis and you don't know what's going to happen to the company and then you say, you know what, F it. If this is the way it's going to be, I'm going to do something good for society. Yeah. So kudos to these guys who just said, you know what, we're going to do something for the inner city. It's all about the photography, and it's all about using photography to help people. Um, yeah, and uh, within this article, they mentioned that their long-term goal is basically to provide grants for photographers, you know, working with either story grants or mobile grants, which is just great. I mean, good job, Hipstamatic. And working with, this is a great niche for them to go into to help teach students about photography. Although I can't imagine learning photography through Hipstamatic. Like, that must just be so, <laughs> you know? It's like, okay, yeah, we're in 2014. That's just how it is. That, you know, that is how it is because everyone takes photos on their, their camera phones anyway. Right. It's like they already own, all these kids already own the tool. Might as well teach them the skill. So it's pretty neat that they don't have to buy any more gear or anything yeah. like that. I can remember even, you know, 10 years ago speaking to teachers who were in like photo education and being like, uh, I'm uh, teaching at the local junior high. I want to throw together a photo program. Can you recommend some low cost cameras uh, that, that maybe we could acquire? And you're mm. like, okay, well, then there's the Canon, you know, S50 at the time or whatever it was. Uh, and that's about $350 or, or whatnot. And so, you know, you're at a public school and you're going to spend $3,500 right. to get cameras that are going to be out of date in a year. Right. Or you just say, all you kids have smartphones, pull them out of your pockets, let's talk about composition, let's look at photography, let's go out and take photos. Yeah, pretty amazing. It's cool. Yeah. Speaking of which iPhone. Sarah, yeah. I got the new iPhone 6, and look, you got the uh, iPhone 5S. I did. Yes, I did. I finally upgraded from my 4. <laughs> Which is, a, I mean, you went from 4 to 5S. I went from 5 to 6. We both had the same leap. True. We, we did. We got to up our Instagram game now. Uh, the iPhone 6 camera has not increased in resolution. It's still only an 8 megapixel camera. I say only because there are cameras out there that are 41 megapixels on a phone. Um, and yet 8, you know, for all practical purposes, 8 for any sort of mobile <laughs> photography is more than enough. Yeah. And so Apple, in my opinion, kind of smartly said, let's try to improve image quality rather than getting into the pixel wars uh, on the camera. And so here is an article on Snap, Snap, Snap Photos. And there, I don't know what this is, Snap, Snap, Snap Photos. Photos. <laughs> dot, it's dot photos too, uh, and it's how the iPhone 6 camera compares to previous iPhone cameras. So they go from everything from the original iPhone, the 1, to the 3G, 3GS, 4, 4S, 5, 5S, and 6. And they have slices of the same scene taken with all uh, seven, eight of these cameras. 
and the the comparison between obviously one and six is night and day. Yeah. Night and day. It's like the the one looks so blurry, so and, blurry. Yeah, it doesn't even. Yeah, was that a camera? I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, and between five S and six, well, in in good lighting conditions, not that much difference. But we're looking at uh, some strawberries in like good light, and between five S and six. Not that much of a difference. Between 5 and 6, there's a difference. It's a little fuzzier. It's not as detailed. The, the tonal range isn't as good. And you keep scrolling down these images. And again, you can find this link on blog.photoshelter.com. And you, you scroll down through the examples, and then you get to stuff like backlit situations, and then you start to really see the phone shine. One through, four, one through 5 on the black backlit situation... It's sort of muddy, it's blown out, there's a lot of flare, and then 5S into 6, all of a sudden you see incredible control. And then when they blow it up, the level of detail is kind of crazy. It's amazing how good these cameras are nowadays. Yeah, and there's not as, and obviously there's not as much digital noise either. Yeah. The noise has just completely disappeared, especially in low light situations too. Yeah, and let's be honest. I mean, I think at this point with, with camera and sensor technology in general, that's what we're really fighting against. Like, the difference between a good camera and, a, and an average camera is really how does it perform in low light at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought this was a really, really interesting little slice, and I can't believe that they still have an iPhone 1 I know. that works. <laughs> how are they keeping that thing charged and alive? <laughs> I know. I mean, the battery must have gone out by now. I know. I don't even remember what cable it used. Oh, man. That's the, oh, so here's the low-light stuff. This is... Look at that. Yeah. Pretty and, wild. And again, 1 through 5, forget it. It looks awful. 5S and 6 look pretty good, but 6, the level of noise is so low, and the detail is incredible, and wow, I'm happy I have a 6. It was yeah. worth a two-year wait. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and you and there's a slow mo video on you on the six, right? Oh, 240 frames per second. That's fun. It's fun. It's fun because think about this before too. Before 240 frames per second in the iPhone six, you had to go and rent like a phantom camera. <laughs> and the phantom cameras, you can't really. First of all, they're hard to rent because not a whole lot of places have them because they're expensive. And some of them, when you when you rent like the phantom gold camera, because I was. Okay, I have a confession to make. Oh, okay. When, when I was challenged for the ice bucket challenge, mm -hmm. I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to do my ice bucket challenge at 1,000 frames per second. Great. So I started inquiring around at how much it would cost to get it, a, a phantom gold camera, which can do, I don't know, 10,000, 100,000 frames per second, whatever it is. And the only place that I found in New York that rent, rented them also said you have to rent the tech as well. You have to rent the tech for the day to operate the camera. Oh. So all of a sudden it was like three thousand dollars. Oh know. my gosh. I ain't paying that. No. I just like a chain. You know what? And so I said, I'm just gonna donate a hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> well, now with the iPhone at two hundred forty frames per second, I could have done it. Yeah, they should have started that challenge post six yeah, release. Why did, they, why did they think about that? Did you did you end up making a video at all? Nah, you know, by the time I got around to it, it was the the whole campaign was waning, and I had already oh. given a hundred bucks because someone else I was traveling, and someone else called me out. And I was like, I can't do this. I'm like in wherever I was. Right. <laughs> okay. Anyway, 240 frames per second, great camera, iPhone 6, super interesting to see the evolution of the sensor over the past whatever seven years of iPhone evolution. Oh yeah, love it. <laughs> love those camera phones. The Forest Service says media needs photography permit in wilderness area, alarming First Amendment advocates. How much is that permit going to cost? $1,500. Wild. And if you're caught as media taking a still or video, you're going to be fined $1,000. Even just with your iPhone? Even with just your iPhone, if you're part of the media. And it's the Forest Service's director who said, oh, this was already a, a law or some, something like that. Mm -hmm. she They're said, just, we're, just trying to, we're just trying to make sure that the wilderness areas stay preserved. 
But she she doesn't even sound like she really knows what she's talking about. You know, and this is what pisses me off about it. We've seen so many instances of overreach by governmental agencies, whether it's cops. I, just, mm. I saw a video last night, a cop, he stops a guy at a gas station who was who was sitting still. He asked the guy, the guy's like outside of his car. He asked the guy to get his license. The guy reaches into his car to get his license, and the cop opens fire on him and shoots him three times. Oh, my God. I was like, are you kidding me? Well, wow. the, the, in that case, the cop was fired, and he's, he's on trial for, uh, to go to jail for up to 20 years as a result of that. Because it's crazy. But we've seen so many instances of government overreach. Yeah. Here's yet another one where it's like there's not a problem, and, and you, now you're creating a problem. Because she was asked to cite specific instances where there was a problem, and she couldn't come up with any. Right, right, exactly. Which really just doesn't make a strong case for them. No, come on, people. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's just like, you know, a person gets into a position of power, and it's like the, I don't know if you took Psychology 101, but there was the Stanford prison experiments. And yeah. When you tell someone they're in the prison guard, they start beating the prisoners. <laughs> right, yes. Ugh. So now well, the, wonder... yeah, forest, so the forest lady is, like, trying to beat down photographers. Right. <laughs> this is just getting ridiculous. It's getting ridiculous. <laughs> well, I mean, I wonder if news publications, you know, uh, TV networks uh, or newspapers will just pay, have to pay, like, an upfront fee for anybody that they are in contract with that's going to go out there and document these places. But I mean, newspapers I mean, don't have any money, and maybe the TV networks could, but... You know, what about all the freelancers that are going out there? I can see a situation where if you're filming a movie or you're doing something for commercial purposes, purposes, then of course you should get a commercial permit. And that's fine because the crews that come in, when they're filming even like an indie movie, is like 12 people. Mm -hmm. But if you're a photojournalist and you're covering, covering something for purposes of, of news, that's crazy. That is your First Amendment right. You should be able to go wherever you want and take a photo. It's public property. It, the, the public pays for it. It's not yeah, exactly. like a private building. Exactly, yeah. Fight the power. I love photography fans out there. Yeah. Melissa Little is one of those people in the photojournalism community who is known by everyone. Uh, not only is she a fantastic photographer, she spends a lot of time in education, uh, she has uh, been a leader at the Eddie Adams Workshop for years and years and years and mentored so many people. She also started a, a, a website called A Photo A Day many, many years ago. And she had, for all of this time, been working at the Tampa Bay Times as a staff photographer. And last week on Twitter, she announced that she took a buyout. And her last day will be October 10th. Uh, and the tweet says, this wasn't how I pictured my career at the TV Times ending. My heart hurts for the newspaper industry. Took the buyout last day is October 10th. And there has just been a tremendous outpouring uh, in social media on Twitter and Facebook of people saying, wow, you, you're, you're awesome. You're the best. You helped me so much when I was younger. Um, you know, this is the worst news for freelancers in Florida because you're going to take all their business. I mean, she's a really <laughs> right. great photographer. Right. Really great photographer. But I was thinking about this in the context of all newspaper and magazine photographers out there who have staff positions. And I don't mean this in a callous or insensitive way, but you're crazy if you haven't planned for this transition. Mm. Because it, there are going to cease to be staff newspaper jobs. And I think that all of the all of the people who went before uh, that transitioned out of these positions, and you know, I think of like Robert Seal, who saw the writing on the wall when he was working for the Sporting News, and he said, "I gotta, I gotta transition my business." And he started building a freelance business simultaneous to his staff position. And when he thought that the the level of income was was commensurate with what he was making, he quit on his own accord, on his own schedule. And I think in this day and age, you just have to be doing that. Mm. And there's enough people that have done it that you can go out and figure out how to do it. Um, but this is tragic. It's tragic for the Tampa Bay Times. It's tragic for uh, the newspaper industry. It's tragic for Melissa, but I have no doubt she's going to be successful. But I hate seeing this stuff. And yeah. I want photographers to be proactive about it. 
Yeah, she absolutely will. I mean, her work, you know, is so strong and stands, so she'll be fine. <laughs> but this is a sad way to go. I photographed a Little League uh, championship with Melissa in, uh, in Pennsylvania, Williamsport, uh, probably like 10, 12, 15 years ago. I don't remember. <laughs> it was a long time ago. And again, it was a situation where you're you're at the same venue, at the same event, in nearly identical photo positions, and then you look at your photos and you look at her photos, and you're it's like you're at a different place. <sighs> Just because she's so good. I mean, she she had photographed a lot of little league. She knew what was what was up, and her eye is like 20 times better than than my eye, at least 20 times better than my eye. Good speed, Melissa Little. You'll be fine. You brought up a little story from the Lens Blog from your home state of Texas. Yes, yes, I am from Texas. I'm proud of it. <laughs> and I kind of feel like this new kind of Texas image is starting to make its way into the public eye with, you know, with Boyhood. I don't know if you've seen that movie. Yeah, it was a great movie. Great movie. I mean, it's an incredibly accurate depiction of Texas in, like, the late 90s, 2000s. But um, no, this series on the Lynn's blog is by Nancy Newberry, and she's based out of, out of Dallas and Marfa. And um, she started, she wanted to create a series on the state she lives in um, that was, you know, different than the rodeos and, you know, the hats, the cowboy hats and all of that type of culture. And she created this very dreamlike series um, which and she discusses that when she was going through the images she even r realized that she had taken a photo that was a dream she had previously had <laughs> which is just that gave me chills when I read that I just think that's so great but um, she photographed a lot of cheerleaders and uh, and band kids which is a huge part of Texas culture huge huge yeah. even I know that Right, yeah, it's like a Friday Night Lights type of thing, of course, but um, I just love these images. I mean, they're she, quirky. They're very quirky. There's something off, you know, about each of them, and she she puts her subjects on on the edge of things, right? So they're, sometimes their face isn't even showing because they're in the shadow. Right. It's just sort of so, um, off-center, and I love that about it. Yeah, you see... If, if you were following traditional compositional rules, I mean, she cuts off body parts, she puts people in shadows or half in shadows. Mm -hmm. um, she, she, she likes the use of, of these strips of light. Yeah, uh, yeah, a lot of... Photos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a lot of cool. diagonal light coming through. It's they, they kind of... I mean, some of these remind me of uh, when we were talking about Flickr's 20 Under 20. Uh -huh. The sort of the color palette and some of the sensibility with the young people in the in the uh, images. Yeah, she's taking pictures of teenagers. Yeah. So. But this yeah. first image is great because I actually love the fact that the 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 girl, the cheerleader leading the pack, is almost completely cut off by this brick post. Right. There's something very dynamic about that because she has the three little ducklings behind her. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, these these are cool. These yeah, are cool, love, quirky photos. Love them. Texas is a dream state. <laughs> John Workman at our office, who just got married. Congratulations, John Workman. Sent yes, congrats. Me this article. Uh, well, it was an article that went to this website. It's a Japanese photographer, Hitoshi Kanzaki. Hitoshi uh, has no use of his legs, so he rolls around in a wheelchair. And he decided to get a little mount on the back of his wheelchair. It's it's uh, little, just a little like, magic arm and uh, super clamp. And he post uh, he posted a camera on top of it on the back of his wheelchair. And he just sort of motored through Tokyo and he took photos with it. Uh, and the project is called Our Street View. And initially, I think when you look at them, you say, "Well, they're not that well composed." That and was then, what I thought, too. Yeah, yeah. and then I kind of looked at them, and a couple things stuck out. Well, first of all, he said there's the inevitable uh, comparison to Google Street View. Mm, uh -huh. um, because the, the images are taken basically at the same height as the Google car, but these photos have been taken sort of intentionally, not for mapping purposes, but for documentation. 
And the other thing that I thought was interesting is the corner of a shoulder appears in a lot of the photos. So in the lower left uh, corner, you'll often see his, his shoulder. And I thought that that brought a little flavor to the images that are obviously sort of devoid from uh, the Google Maps images. He usually carries around like a medium format camera. Um, and then for this project, he just kind of went around. He, he got an exhibition out of this. And I, I think they're sort of norm core-ish in if we can use that term for photography. Uh -huh. But I think that it's an interesting concept. Yeah. I, yeah, these don't blow me away. I mean, at all. <laughs> You're not a fan. You're not a fan. No, I'm not really a fan. They, they, don't, they don't do much for me. Uh, and so do you think that that... You know, we see situa situations with blind photographers, and here's a situation with a guy who can't actually physically stand up. And mm -hmm. since he can't really stand up, then he's really limited in the in the movements that he can do to frame a photo. That's, that's so true. Yes. Give him any bonus for being like, okay, that's a cool concept at least. I like the. Sh I think the best part about the series is the shoulder in the corner as that okay. visual cue and visual reminder of I am right. sitting down. I am not. 100% mobile. Right. Um, but other than that, I mean, you can still, he could still wait for the moment to happen. This is be true. Better. This is true. Uh, and also, like, the color palette is just pretty, like, blah to me. So. It was unclear to me. Here's one where you can see him uh, in the reflection. It's unclear to me whether he has a camera just on an intervalometer or whether he's actually triggering. Oh, right. Um, and so whether that limits sort of his capabilities. Oh, uh-huh. Um, because it looks like, I, I, I don't want to make too many assumptions, but it looks like maybe he has kind of restricted use of his hands as well. Mm -hmm. In which case, it does make it very interesting to say, wow, I'm, I don't have a lot of mobility at all. I don't have any manual dexterity. Here's my concept, and I'm going to go out and execute it. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I'm just giving that's... him props for trying. Okay, he definitely deserves props for trying. All right. <laughs> All right. Oh, man. <laughs> now, now I feel bad. <laughs> uh, some, of his, some of his medium format stuff, he shoots a lot on film, is, is quite nice. I, you know, I'll, I'll say with, with those things as well, like the composition, he doesn't always nail the focus, but again, if he has limited mobility, that's, that's going to be a problem. Right. I'd be interested um, to see his film work, definitely. Yeah, we'll look, we'll look at that offline, huh? For sure, yes. Okay. <laughs> Richard Prince, we, were, we, we had a copyright, uh, Law School 101 was the panel at Photoville that we hosted for our Luminance Talks. And we had uh, Bill Kramer and uh, Vicky, oh gosh, I don't remember her last name. I'm embarrassed. Uh, she's a, a copyright lawyer. Um, yeah. And they were talking about a, a number of different things, and one of the things that came up was Richard Prince. Richard Prince, as you may know, is a conceptual artist, and he's basically made his name by appropriating other people's art and then cutting something out or pasting something on. Uh, so there's a situation of Prince versus Carew. Carew was a guy who had been shooting Rastafarians for many, many years. He came out with a book and an exhibition, and then Carew was not commercially successful. He was not well-known. Richard Prince went in took his photos and then put guitars, electric guitars in the hands of these Rastafarians in the forest when they were like carrying like a stick or something like that. <laughs> or he would cover their eyes or he would put a blue piece of construction paper or whatnot. And then those images sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Made Richard Prince very uh, wealthy, very famous. Carrie you sued him in what to me is a very obvious misappropriation and a copyright infringement yeah. But in whatever district that the case came in, they sided with Richard Prince. Oh, wow. And so Richard Prince is able to basically do this until there's another challenge and, and then they're successful. His latest art project, which is showing at the Gagosian Gallery, Gagosian's a very famous uh, art dealer here in New York City, is Instagram art, where he's appropriated... Uh, the feeds of famous people. Here's one of Pamela Anderson. And the only change he makes is he adds 
a comment as if he commented on the <laughs> Instagram image itself. Um, so here's one of Jeff Koons, one of his balloon animals, um, and Richard Prince just uses a whole series of emojis. <laughs> Richard Prince for emoji, 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 emoji. And then he's printing these out very large on camera. Yeah, he's right. printing yeah. them out uh, very large, and he's selling them for like $100,000 a piece. Wow. Um, now, the interesting thing about this is that the gallery is not open to the public. It's by by appointment only, and I guess you have to be sort of a known a known quantity in the art world, as in you're capable of buying this art if you want to see the art. And I don't know if it's in part because he's trying to avoid any controversy of copyright infringement, because he know he knows the audience is already there, so he doesn't have to open it up to everyone. Whatever the case is, I just don't think it's right. He's setting a terrible, terrible precedent. He he has already set a terrible precedent. Uh, for for artists' rights, and it's a travesty. It'd be one thing if he said, "You know what? I made a hundred thousand dollars. Here's ten grand for the source work. Thanks, man." Yeah, that'd be totally different. Whether it's ten percent or five percent or twelve percent or fifty percent or whatever, I don't know what the the correct percentage is. I just know that the original artist should be making money off of this stuff. It's a travesty. This is not fair use in my opinion. It does not pass any of the sanity checks for fair use. And I think he's a jerk. I yeah. said it. <laughs> the, the, the series is, oh, wow. is a little quirky and funny, so maybe he's going to say it's satirical in nature. I, I cracked a smile at some of them, so maybe I fail my own test, but this ain't right, man. No, it's really not. It's not, and especially, I mean, even these uh, celebrities, like, uh, he has a Sky Ferreira one. She, within her caption, did not give credit to the photographer. Who knows who took that picture? Yeah, this is we true, as a too. public don't, or we as an Instagram follower of Sky don't. You know, it's not, yeah, it's, um, this is really dicey and not cool. <laughs> uh, Instagram. Well, you know, as a concept, it's pretty interesting, and I think that there's there's when you look at his ability, you know, as an older artist to then uh, really take advantage of like current trends in photography, like Instagram. It's very pop arty of him to do. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. you're a jerk. So, <laughs> final note: you're a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know this this website called the foxesblack.com. We found a, a couple of new websites that feature photography. Well, this is a website called the foxesblack.com and the photographer is Nora Luther and she shot photos of food but as their component ingredients but not laid out on a table flying through the air. <laughs> so I don't know what we're looking at here. This is there's some prosciutto. It's like prosciutto, yeah. There's zucchini. some uh, zucchini. There's some spices. Clearly, this is composited, but you know, just like you know those milk photos, the calendar where he composited like a thousand shots of milk being thrown at these girls to do like. A oh color. yeah, those were great. There's a lot of sophistication in like the art of throwing stuff to make it look photogenic is an art. Yeah, especially like a slice of meat. Yeah, <laughs> like how do you get it to? curve and open up properly and whatnot. So yeah. these, unless she's putting it, no, she couldn't have put it on a wire. How do you, yeah. Mm, I don't, I don't, I don't think know so. No. I don't know how it works. Um, but it's a really cool series. I, I, th I thought it was well done. I mean, it's it's neat, I think in part because she picks uh, a color palette of ingredients mm -hmm. um, and she's shooting it against uh, black and she's lighting it from the side. Um, and so all of these colors pop really nicely and you get a lot of dimension. There's a lot of depth in the photos uh, that I really appreciate. But these were fun. Yeah, you know, it's kind of hard to shake up the food photography genre, but yeah. she did it. <laughs> I, I, I will say, I mean, it, it's exciting visually and it has a lot of movement to it. It's not, you don't get that same visceral reaction as seeing an image of the food like right out of the oven where you're like, I really, I'm really hungry now. No, but I feel like this is a great way to depict recipes for a recipe. Yes, and that was the intent. Yeah, right, right, right. That was the intent in the first place. So, mission accomplished. Good job, Nora. So, I saw this 
uh, series by Nora, and then I started poking around the Fox is Black, so here's another one from the Fox is Black. Uh, Michael Wolf photographs the shadows of trees in a film noir style. Uh, I So we were talking about Hitoshi's images, and you said I, I wasn't blown away by these images. I actually wasn't blown away by these images either. But mm -hmm. I thought it was super interesting conceptually. And yeah. so I have to give props conceptually. Like, it's it's like... It's a certain time of day to get particular shadows. He staked out trees that he thought cast shadows. Some of them are hard. Some of them are a little bit softer edged. He found these backgrounds that he thought was interesting, and he went out and did it. Yeah, I know. I, I really like these. I mean, there's something so stark and precise. Yeah. I mean, obviously, Michael is an amazing technical, like, technically, he's so talented. Um, and I, I really love them. I, but I also, I kind of had the same thought when I first viewed them. Like, I feel like this might be something that you turn into your photo one darkroom class. Like, <laughs> in your role, and your teacher just kind of, like, overpasses it. And is like, no, this is a boring shot. You know, continue yeah. on. But it, they, don't, they don't hit you sort of viscerally. You have to kind of look at them and then look at them in the series to appreciate what he's done. Yeah, agreed. But it, and it does create this kind of, yeah, this very, this mood. Film noir. And, so. you know, they mentioned in the article sort of the juxtaposition of the urban landscape with these, the shadow of nature against it, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was also interesting. And it's, he did these all, well, it looks like most in the fall and the winter, so it's not like these, like, lush leaves. Exactly. Leaves. It's just this, like, stark. Well, trunk. here, and here's an interesting one, and again, all of these links you can find on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com, but it's an iron railing that has... A, a vine pattern to it next to a tree that's budding with some leaves. Um, and so it's an interesting juxtaposition of shapes that are kind of similar. One is a man-made, quote, organic form, and the other one is truly organic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is nice. <laughs> All right. The last set of images for the day. We always try to end up on an upbeat note, and this thing went super viral. <laughs> <laughs> it is a series of photos uh, by the American photographer Sandro Miller. And Sandro teamed up with the actor John Malkovich to recreate iconic portrait photos from history. So we're looking first at the Migrant Mother by Dorothea Lang. Um, that was part of the FSA program, photo program, back in the 20s and 30s. And, you know, if you looked at it really quickly, you'd think this was the original image. These are very funny. Yeah. Come on, John Malkovich, what a great actor. I mean, he really embodies all of these characters in every single shot. He just nails it. And, you know, it's not he's not using, like, prosthetics, but here he is... Uh, as a, as a Hitchcock in Albert Watson's photo, and he just makes his face look really fat. Yeah. You know, he might be wearing, I think he's got a padded suit on to get a little bit more girth, mm -hmm. um, but his face is just his face. Now, the interesting thing that I thought about when seeing this was, for, first, obviously, everybody reacted to how funny these were. But then I thought about from what a great way to sort of learn photography and photographers and photographic styles through the use of humor. Because you ought to know every single one of these photos. Whether you're a photographer or not, you ought to know these photos. And if you are a photographer, you ought to know who the photographer was in all mm. of these photos. Right. Um, because they are sort of very iconic. So, I mean, this... It looks like Warhol. This looks like <laughs> Warhol. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Annie Leibovitz cover with John Lennon and Yoko Ono for Rolling Stone. I, I don't know that this guy, Arthur Sass, who took the Albert Einstein photo, I actually don't know his, his story. I don't know whether he was that famous or not, but that, that is a great photo. Yeah, but, you know, Bert famous. Stern, uh, David Bailey, Gordon Parks. I mean, there's just so many. Herb Ritz, Arbus. I mean, come on. Come on. Yeah. And then Karsh for the Hemingway portrait at the Amazing. end. Amazing. 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 Yeah. I would, people should do more of these where they recreate stuff and they, they talk about who the original photographer is and they, they generate interest in photography because celebrities can do that. 
celebrities can do that. Let's, you know what? Let's stop charging the media fifteen hundred dollars to take photos. <laughs> stop shooting people at the gas station when you ask them for a license and they're getting it. Oh um, my gosh! And let's take some good photos. Let's go do that. Woo! <laughs> Another full show. We can go back to our faces, even though we didn't want to show them now. But here we are. <laughs> Sarah J, our next show. Uh, well, I will be in Jackson, Wyoming, for Rich Clarkson's Photography at the Summit Nature Workshop. That's right. Are you so excited? I, I'm totally excited. It's one of the best workshops I've ever uh, been to. Um, and uh, But I don't have access to my normal... Set up. I'm not going to be traveling with this huge mic and huge headphones um, and my LED panel, which illuminates me. I think I might be in a dimly lit closet, literally. Um, so maybe we won't show my face too much next week either. <laughs> All right. Well, if you're up for it, I'm up for it. We'll try. It might, I don't know how the internet's going to be in the closet. I liter literally did a webinar last year from the closet, so I think it'll work out. I remember. Okay. I remember that webinar. Uh, so we'll try. We'll try. But uh, in the meantime, take some nice photos. We'll see you next week, Sarah. So for Sarah Jacobs, this is Alan Murabayashi signing off for another episode of I Love Photography Live. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye.